Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Philip Payne. I'm the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSI Act. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI Act webinar announcement. Uh, you can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, uh, please click the three dots labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A for the benefit of those who dial in. Uh, over the phone, I'll read those questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have a technical issue during a presentation, please have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website once the webinar is posted. The go-to webinar uh, button will take you to the YouTube link uh, for the CSI webinar page where you can find today's recording. Um, with that said, I'd like to introduce today's uh, presenter. Uh, Mr. Andrew Brooks serves as CDAO's lead scientist for responsible AI artificial intelligence tools where he facilitates knowledge sharing, risk identification, and decision making for AI cap capabilities. He's also the product owner for the US DOD's RAI toolkit. Uh, before joining CDAO, he was an all source intelligence analyst and analytical methodologist at DIA, where he established a new analytic career specialty focused on data science and computational techniques. Uh, Mr. Brooks is a graduate of the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies and holds an MS in Data Science from the University of Missouri, an MA in German and European Studies from Georgetown University, and a BA in German from the Citadel. Drew, turn it over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here uh, presenting this webinar today. Uh, my name is Drew Brooks. Um, as stated, I uh, work for the DOD Chief Digital and AI Office, um, and I run the Responsible AI Toolkit. Um, so we're gonna hear a lot more about that, um, but we wanted to uh, wanted to start off with uh, sort of a definition of Responsible AI and um, how, uh, how the DOD is um, approaching Responsible AI from a practical standpoint. I'm seeing in the chat right now, people saying you don't hear me. Any, uh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll take it that that's uh, not a universal problem. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, what is responsible artificial intelligence? Um, the value proposition to, uh, of- the Share your slides again, uh, since I took over to uh, share the video. Thank you. 
All right, there we go. So responsible AI. So the value proposition of responsible AI is that we must be able to use technology in a manner that's consistent with our laws and traditions. Um, in support of uh, the CDAO's overall mission of accelerating the adoption of artificial intelligence technologies, uh, the responsible AI team uh, is here to uh, enable that adoption um, by making sure that we can um, use these uh, use these technologies um, in support of our values in alignment with our values. Um, we think that's important because national power uh, depends on our reputation, depends on uh, the soft power uh, that we've built up over um, generations of um, being committed to certain um, values and ethics, uh, especially in the military. And when said like that, you know, it's a fairly uncontroversial statement. Um, but the question, of course, is what does that actually mean um, uh, specifically? Um, and then will the steps we take to um, uh, pursue responsible AI somehow stifle innovation, slow down this adoption? Um, on our team, we're really committed to identifying and developing practical resources to make uh, our AI um, both easy and obvious to adopt. Um, we want to take these high-level principles like the um, DOD AI ethical principles, uh, the laws of war, um, you know, principles in the Constitution and the, the Declaration of Independence, uh, and actually translate them into um, really concrete actions, processes, um, things that uh, AI teams, project teams um, can implement in a real way in their workflow. Our contention is um, paying that you know, upfront investment in responsible AI processes is gonna pay dividends later on in terms of effectiveness and trust um, that the speed of adoption and use within the department um, can you know, proceed uninhibited um, because both the users, um, the technology, the um, providers of the technology in, in industry and in academia, uh, our allies um, and the American public uh, can feel assured that we're uh, using these um, AI tech uh, in a responsible way um, and in a way where we can understand how it works uh, and control it. Um, so as I mentioned, the CDA over overall um, is committed to um, increasing the, uh, the speed of adoption of technology, accelerating the adoption of uh, AI technology throughout the department. Um, our division in particular um, serves as the primary technical advisor to the department on responsible AI. Um, and we, um, uh, sorry, so three basic things that our division are responsible for. So technical advice to the department on what our AI means and how we can approach it. Uh, the development of tools and capabilities, um, including guidelines, um, but also technical resources uh, that can enable that uh, responsible AI adoption uh, and the development of a community of practitioners throughout the department. People who understand uh, what responsible AI means um, and uh, how to actually pursue it within their organizations. Uh, we start with the DOD AI ethical principles that I mentioned uh, a little while ago. So the uh, US Department of Defense was the first military in the world uh, to adopt AI principle or ethical principles for AI. Um, these are a set of, um, uh, well, set of principles, a, a set of ideas uh, that we're committed to as a department um, in our in our adoption of AI. Um, again, these are not, you know, uh, very controversial um, as written. I mean, it's it's basically, you know, stating that we're going to do good things with artificial intelligence and not bad things. Um, so the question comes: How do we actually implement those um, in practice? Uh, the REI strategy and implementation plan um, is that operational guidance that we work under. Um, it has six core tenets. Um, governance, where we're going to um, be able to, you know, modernize structures and understand um, how teams are using AI and really help those responsible uh, for it um, 
make sure that they understand what technology is being used in their in their um, organizations um, and how it's being used. Uh, improving warfighter trust, um, especially through uh, new um, methods for uh, T&E and validation and verification. Um, understanding the the uh, product and acquisition life cycle. It's a lot of where the tools that I work on come in um, so that we can help people um, beginning, you know, right at the beginning of like experimentation or requirements generation, uh, understand what, you know, steps they need to take to be able to um, adopt or develop technology in the most responsible way. Um, helping teams with requirements validation, of course, an you know, important Pentagon topic. Um, building that ecosystem like we talked about, making sure there's um, uh, practitioners who understand RAI throughout both the DOD, uh, as well as building those international partnerships so that we can cooperate on the same, uh, on the same basis. Um, and then building the workforce, so um, working on um, training and other resources for the entire DOD workforce uh, to make sure that people um, both understand you know, how AI technologies work, how data analytics work, um, and then um, what uh, RAI um, means and how you actually implement it. Um, now I want to deep dive uh, being the um, you know lead for uh, responsible AI tools um, and you know knowing the, uh, the technical audience that I'm presenting here too. Um, I really want to talk about the, the tools and capability um, the uh, that, that we're um, developing, acquiring, identifying. Um, so when we talk about um, tools, you know, there's a number of different things we mean on that, all the way from software packages. So, you know, literally like Python packages that we've both developed um, and identified in the open source world uh, to do things like bias detection, explainability, um, documentation template so that you can um, more easily get to a point where, you know, you, you've identified the most important things that you need to document in order to share um, with either, you know, up and down the chain of command, but also laterally uh, share, you know, the important, um, uh, important aspects of the system as you build it. Um, frameworks and checklists to help kind of bootstrap expertise so that you don't have to be uh, an expert in responsible AI or even an, an expert in data or, or AI technology um, in order to know like what questions to ask uh, of vendors, for instance, if you're um, uh, buying something that maybe you're not developing in-house um, or you know help you sort of identify quickly what risks tend to be common, what things um, you know go wrong more often than not or go wrong more often than other things so you can you know be a, on the lookout for those things. Um, knowledge sharing tools. So this helps us, um, you know, document best practices, lessons learned, uh, help advance sort of the discipline of responsible AI overall, um, and also share that information uh, again with the entire community uh, so that we don't have to keep relearning the same things over and over again. Um, and then executive dashboards, uh, it's, you know, a, um, part of what uh, is a challenge within the DOD uh, is communicating sort of from that technical uh, developer side or, or PM side uh, to leadership that may be, you know, a little bit less um, technically experienced, um, but still has to um, understand that risk uh, and own the risk uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, the way we organize all of these tools that we've identified and developed um, is with a, a resource we call the RAI Toolkit. So the RAI Toolkit is at that um, Tradewind AI uh, URL. I think I'll, I'll have later in the presentation, I'll have the whole URL built out. Um, but Tradewind AI is our um, acquisition focused website that uh, CDAO runs to help people um, more quickly uh, identify and acquire AI technologies. Um, and right now we're hosting the Responsible AI Toolkit there. Um, because we really want to make sure we're messaging both to um, the, the industry and academy, uh, academic folks who are providing us models and systems, um, as well as people within uh, the department who are acquiring them that, you know, these are the sorts of questions um, that uh, we're going to be asking um, and resources help you 
um, sort of create those artifacts, uh, create the documentation uh, that leads to really responsible AI. Um, we want to make sure, because there's so many different tools out there that you can use uh, to get after specific parts um, of responsible AI, specific pieces of those uh, the ethical framework, uh, we wanted to help make those tools more findable, usable, interoperable. Um, and so the REI toolkit uh, was developed uh, with that in mind. Um, it uh, you know provides a, a standard process, though it is you know tailorable, uh, modular. Right now, um, entirely you know voluntary, so you don't have to you know go through from from one to n. Uh, you can sort of pick the pieces that uh, work with your you know particular organizational governance structure. Um, but it's a process for demonstrating how a given project um, is aligned or consistent with the AI ethical principles. Uh, it enables traceability throughout the life cycle of a project, um, promoting assurance, um, collects lessons learned. So if people are uh, developing artifacts, filling things out, um, we can you know, make those available to other project teams so you can see um, you know, exemplary uh, uh, use cases or, or ways that um, things have worked really well. Um, and it also provides a framework that we can have in common with partners and allies. Um, so one example of that, uh, we've worked with NATO really carefully, really closely, excuse me, uh, to develop a very similar toolkit uh, focused on um, the principles of ethical AI that uh, NATO as an organization adopted. Uh, we're currently working with the White House and the Office of Management and Budget right now uh, to build, again, a very similar toolkit um, to uh, enable like uh, compliance with the new um, OMB memo, the executive order on um, artificial intelligence. Basically, all of these have the same underlying um, principles they're just sort of aligned. The language is a little bit um, changed to, you know, directly speak to whatever the, the guiding kind of documents are. Um, overall, our, our thinking there is that uh, if we get to a point where a lot of this language is um, common, a lot of the processes are common, uh, we can do a lot more um, sharing of, of models and of systems um, and build to a lot more interoperability because we've kind of established that a community that that um, you know can trust that you know the the partner either within you know the U.S. interagency or um, an ally or, you know uh, a foreign ally or partner um, has built something um, in a you know similarly kind of responsible way, um, and so we can uh, more quickly and more effectively kind of uh, cooperate on a, a technological level. Uh, to build the toolkit, uh, we took um, you know classic like bottom up and and top down approach. So starting on the top down, um, we you know considering all of the guidance uh, that exists, uh, especially that existed in 2023 when we first wrote this toolkit, um, we you know figured out what categories of information, categories of tools. Uh, we would need to um, comply with all of those um, or, you know, demonstrate alignment with all of those um, different pieces of guidance about how the department uh, is going to um, develop artificial intelligence and use it. Um, at the same time, we did uh, a pretty extensive sort of market research, um, academic research about what kind of tools, processes, um, playbooks already exist. And so as you see there, we pulled uh, pretty extensively from the you know, uh, the NIST uh, AI risk management framework and playbook, uh, IEEE 7000 standards, um, responsible AI guidelines that uh, Defense uh, Innovation Unit developed, uh, which are really excellent. Um, and sort of tried to fit those into um, those categories that we saw uh, were going to be necessary. So that way we could identify gaps, uh, we could understand where to start putting our team's resources. Um, uh, against um, other things that we need to develop. One of the things we noticed in a lot of this research about tools and frameworks and things that already exist um, is that uh, in very few cases was there uh, something we could just grab and say, okay, we're just gonna implement this wholesale um, in the DOD. We're, we're a, uh, uh, an organization with a lot of challenges. You know, Being the largest organization in the world, 
um, having the huge diversity of use cases from um, things that are super common, uh, business cases or um, areas where there's a lot of research like AI and medicine uh, that we do a lot of here in DOD, where there's you know a, a really good um, you know, set of case studies, set of tools, things that people have built, but all the way up to like lethal, um, you know, lethal autonomous weapons or um, other, you know, high intensity combat kind of things where there's just really not a lot of, you know, academic work or um, uh, industry corollaries that we uh, need to work with. So we have to be able to, you know, cover this whole spectrum of different use cases um, and different priorities. So we wanted to make sure that this toolkit um, can work even if you just take a little piece of it here, a little piece of it there, mix and match it. Uh, to fit your exact use case or your exact organization. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, it's, you know, traceable so that we can, you know, um, as you uh, create artifacts, create documents using it, uh, that you can, you know, consistently show at the end your sort of um, case for why a system uh, should be trusted and should be considered as uh, aligned with those ethical principles. Um, we wanted to make sure it was as lightweight as possible, um, though we have, uh, I'll admit, a lot more work to do uh, on that front. Um, but because we know there's, you know, a, a huge, again, diversity of, of teams working either, you know, just one or two people doing an experiment all the way up to some huge, you know, program of record that we need to support. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, people uh, with different roles kind of can see themselves uh, in there. Uh, so that we, um, you know, tagged a lot of the different um, tools and a lot of the um, processes with a, uh, a RASCII matrix so that you can understand, you know, given my role, uh, where do I fit in? What parts of this should I be um, most concerned with? Um, and then finally, we wanted to make sure that it didn't assume any sort of pre-existing knowledge about uh, responsible AI or about uh, AI in general. Um, so in areas where we were kind of um, stepping into, you know, things that were getting a little bit jargony or things that um, required a little bit of uh, understanding uh, to be able to answer uh, that we could as much as possible point to a, another tool or resource so you can say, okay, go out and look at that. Um, and then that should help you answer this question. Um, so the uh, components, uh, the, the, the way it's built. So I'll mention this tool uh, and resource database. Um, that's really the heart of um, uh, the heart of the toolkit. Um, that's over 70 different things that you know we found kind of out in the wild um, or things that we're you know building ourselves right now uh, to help people do uh, responsible AI development. Um, we're putting the finishing touches right now on a uh, generative AI specific version of it, uh, where we've identified over 30 more um, tools and resources that are really specific for uh, LLMs and Gen AI. Uh, so you'll hear about that more, um, hopefully around the end of the month. Um, but then we wanted to make sure that people had a way of um, navigating through that, um, uh, through that list of tools in alignment with like the AI product sort of development life cycle. So that's where the shield assessment comes through. Um, the shield assessment steps you through from um, your very, you know, very beginning, like imagining a use case um, through development, testing, um, uh, implementation, you know, integration, uh, and even finally um, retirement of a system um, and helps you understand or helps identify like what questions you need to be asking and what tools you might be able to um, uh, use uh, to do so. Um, in development right now, a uh, little bit more on the kind of meta analysis of it. Um, so, you know, helping people uh, who are maybe responsible for a project, but not the ones actively engaged in building it, um, understand uh, and evaluate the progress against uh, responsible AI um, considerations. Um, and then again, especially with the, you know, the impetus of the OMB memo, National Security Memorandum, uh, we understand there's a lot more um, need for uh, resources on that side. Um, so back to the, the shield planning process uh, and its companion um, DAGGER risk assessment. So the DAGGER stands for Defense AI Guide to Risk. Um, 
and it's a, a tool to help people sort of break down all of the different um, areas where there might be risk in a given AI project uh, and start identifying those most important um, risks that they need to consider how you're going to mitigate. Um, going through that at the beginning of a project helps you flag kind of the most important things that you need to be concerned about uh, at the beginning um, that then drive uh, the things you do throughout the shield assessment um, as you, you know, further hone uh, what the actual risk is and what kind of mitigations you can take uh, to make sure that some step taken, you know, early on in your like data preparation, for instance, uh, to mitigate some risk isn't then undone later uh, inadvertently by trying to optimize for something else. Um, so the, while the initial release of the, um, yeah, so while, while the initial um, release was just a static document, uh, we um, next put it into a web app. Um, and so on this web app, you can actually um, interact with this um, database of tools, um, search it using you know, various filters, um, understanding which ones, for instance, are you know, high code uh, versus you know, low code, just checklist kind of things. Um, you can align them to uh, various other pieces of guidance like um, the you know, AI RMF, um, or uh, you can you know, search by ethical principle that you're in interested in. Um, you can also sort the um, shield assessment and the different pieces of it by uh, your RAI role. Um, and so we looked at um, all of the roles within the uh, defense um, cyber workforce, uh, um, sorry, defense cyber workforce uh, mapping of, um, you know, different uh, cyber focused or, or uh, especially data and AI focused roles uh, within the department, uh, as well as just people we know uh, would have some role to play. Um, we were able to um, identify who would be uh, responsible, accountable, supporting, uh, consulted or informed uh, at each of these steps. Um, and then finally, as I've mentioned a couple times, this, you know, RAI or AI development life cycle um, that's, that's so important. Um, you know, we know um, in general, this is kind of how uh, an artificial intelligence system is created, or at least in an ideal, in an ideal world, you know, you uh, start with your requirements and a good uh, design uh, design process, start with your requirements, um, you know, work on like ideas of how you're going to fill them and, and then um, assess, you know, what's most appropriate given the data you have, given the, the use case and your constraints, um, either develop or acquire that technology and then start testing, evaluating and using it and putting that feedback, you know, very important loop back into the um, development um, so that you're continuously kind of um, retraining or reconsidering what the um, uh, requirements or sorry, uh, how well the technology is actually meeting your requirements. Um, within our toolkit, we have uh, what we call gates. Um, so sort of indicated by the red lines here. Um, and that was our first hack at trying to take a, um, you know, minimum viable approach to responsible AI. Uh, so you can filter on the gates and that'll give you like, if you do nothing else within this ideation step, for instance, you really need to make sure you hit these couple things. Um, that way you can, it can be a little bit more, you know, tailorable modular for um, different size teams or, or teams with, you know, different sort of risk profiles, right? Because um, so we always say, you know, if you're developing AI to help you like choose your socks, um, you probably don't need to be uh, as, you know, concerned about all the risks and, and really drilling down um, as if you're doing something that, uh, for instance, is making, you know, HR decisions uh, about people, you know, people's or um, any of the more, you know, even more kind of life and health and safety um, uh, impacting um, use cases that we have in the department. Um, so this is a screenshot of what the, the toolkit actually looks like on the website. You can navigate on the uh, the left side there um, uh, throughout all of the you know RAI activities or AI activities within that um, life cycle. Uh, 
you can um, at, at each step, you know, you uh, at each step you sort of get presented with the most relevant question that you need to ask. Um, and then those blue boxes there link to uh, tools that you can use. So for instance, for um, uncertainty quantification, it's you know, a really important thing to be able to know um, for a given model uh, how, um, how certain it is or how, yeah, how certain you should be that the model is giving you uh, an accurate output, uh, which tends to come from you know, how well does the uh, match between the data that it's looking at right now uh, look like the data a model was trained on. Um, and then we give you a, a library of, of tools, in this case, you know, a, a Python library uh, that our partners up at MIT helped develop um, that you can actually like put in your um, workflow and your code um, to help you get at that uncertainty quantification. Um, over on the right side, uh, you'll see filters for um, gate, yes or no, you can turn that on and off. Um, as well as project roles. So if you're looking at, um, you know, I'm just a, um, you know, if, I, if I'm the, the like data steward or, um, uh, yeah, program manager, for instance, like what is the most important that, uh, that I need to look at? Um, and finally, the uh, most important, or not most important, the, the last important kind of piece of functionality in here uh, is our, you know, print and import export function. Um, so right now on this website, because it's on a .com, um, because we wanted to make, you know, get it out in use in the public, um, we're not saving any of the information that people put in there on, on the website. So as you go in and um, fill out answers to these questions, it's just being saved in your local um, browser cache. Um, and so you really have to um, either uh, export, so if you hit that export button on the upper left, uh, you'll get a JSON um, output of the, uh, um, of all of the, the, um, sorry, JSON file output of all of the, uh, responses that you've given, which you can then import back in, in order to pick up where you left off, uh, or you can print a PDF, uh, that'll give you, um, again, what question and then what response. Um, so we're working on, you know, a next iteration where it'll actually, um, save these, uh, um, save these inputs so project teams can kind of collaborate on this website and use it a little bit more as a you know project planning or project management tool um, and we also want to make sure that that's then on a um, dot mill site uh, with a little bit upgraded um, you know data security um, so that you know we can keep uh, uh, keep that data within the DoD um, so here is that link to uh, the REI toolkit um, it's, you can also get to it from the CDAO website, which is www.ai.mil. Um, there's a link to it uh, right on that front page. Um, like I said, we're um, probably going to be um, moving off of the, uh, the Tradewin site, or at least having um, duplicates of it uh, on a .mil site so we can um, have a little bit more data security. Um, but we wanted to make sure it was, uh, you know, broadly um, available as possible uh, when it was first launched. Speaking of future, um, you know, future plans, um, as I mentioned, we're uh, working on um, other, uh, you know, a, a new version of it that's really focused on generative AI, AI and LLMs. Um, but we're going to make that available within the department um, very soon um, and then, you know, publicly uh, shortly after uh, initially in a document and then integrated into this web app um, so that you can, you know, select if you're using um, some of these, you know, foundation models or, or um, large language models, you can get resources that are really tailored uh, specifically to those concerns. Um, we're working, like I mentioned, with the, um, the folks at uh, OMB um, to make sure that we're supporting um, the new, you know, guidance that's coming out. Um, as well as doing a number of, you know, tabletop exercises, mock reviews, um, use case kind of working through the old, um, the entire toolkit uh, to stress test it a little bit. So we're always looking for partners who are interested in doing that. Um, our, you know, trade-off can be that we can, you know, support your work a little bit, um, help you find, you know, um, uh, 
find risks or, or um, interrogate uh, the project you're doing to make, you know, see how well it, um, uh, how well it holds up and how well it complies um, with the trade-off for us being, you know, we get more uh, examples of it being used and we find ways that we need to uh, improve these resources. Um, we're doing that also um, internationally. Um, and then um, we're also working on um, some acquisition focus uh, guidance specifically. Um, since, you know, we started out with the kind of um, uh, paradigm or, or mindset of you know, supporting the project teams that are actually developing technologies. Um, but we understand, you know, within the department, we do um, probably a lot more um, buying than we do, you know, coding these things or building them ourselves. Um, finally, uh, the stuff that I've, you know, spend most of my time working on um, is additional functionality uh, for the tool itself. Um, so we're going to be rolling out some um, user interface improvements, the ability to, you know, save your inputs, um, collaborate within the tool. Um, we're going to uh, get some more filters uh, and better tailorability uh, so that we can focus on, you know, given your use case and given the technology you're looking at, like what specific resource from the whole list of things that we found uh, is probably most applicable. Um, and then we want to be able to, um, you know, integrate feedback and make it more tailorable for individual teams. So um, as, you know, different organizations, different components within the department um, and elsewhere, you know, building out their governance structures, uh, we see that people are going to want, um, you know, customized versions basically of this toolkit uh, to be able to support their specific processes or the, the specific things that they're most worried about. Um, and so we're going to build some, some technical ways to support that. Um, in addition to our, um, you know, principal support of it. Um, I want to end with this, um, you know, quote from Secretary Austin, um, you know, just to, to bring it back kind of full circle to my initial um, uh, statements about, you know, the importance of RAI kind of as a discipline and as a way of uh, approaching these technologies. Um, it's something, you know, I, I believe in really, uh, uh, strongly myself, um, but I think it's something that also supports, um, you know, the, the oldest traditions we have uh, as a professional military um, to, you know, understand uh, the, you know, the ethics and responsibility uh, around all of our weapons and all of our tools. Um, and so this is a way of, you know, making sure that even as we're adopting the, the newest, you know, cutting edge tech, uh, that we can be as competent in it uh, as we are um, in the other tools uh, that we use in the military and that we know uh, that we can use them responsibly. Um, with that, I'm going to open up for some questions. I see there's already some um, here in the um, chat, so I can kind of go through. Um, uh, that, was, that was a great presentation. Um, as Mr. Brooks just said, the Q&A is now open. Um, before we, before we dive into that, as far as a couple of administrative items, uh, yes, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, please check back to the CSI website. Uh, we'll post that recording uh, within a day or two, or you can go directly to the CSI YouTube page uh, for the recording of today's presentation. Um, and as far as the slides, the slides are updated to the website um, as of right now. Um, the link has been placed in the chat a couple of times, but always, also check back to the CSI webinar announcement um, and then at the bottom of the page, you'll be able to uh, download the presentation. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions for the Q and A, please uh, put those in now. I'll kind of step through those uh, one by one. Um, so the first question we had, um, which I think you've kind of addressed, but um, just for completeness, we'll go over it again. Uh, from C Miller, is TradeWindAI.com the trusted domain for the RAI toolkit? Yes. Yeah. Um... It is so that's where that's where the toolkit lives, um, and that's where the TradeWind site as a whole um, has a lot of really good resources for um, acquisition of AI, um, and um, so that's uh, definitely something I would check out if you're interested in um, you know adopting AI, um, bringing some of those technologies into your uh, into your work. Uh, our next question from Dr. Brian. Uh, would you be willing to brief the CNS as subcommittee on 13 November via Teams? Um, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Mr. Brooks kind of handle that offline. Uh, he was kind enough to kind of share his contact information with us. 
um, as you can see on the slide here. Um, if you have uh, any other questions um, with for a specific request, um, we could probably handle those offline. Yeah, thanks. Um, Please send me a note. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, the next question we have from Jesse. Um, over the course of the presentation, a number of documents, tools, and information that CDAO has developed um, has been presented. I've been I've be, I've become aware of Nipper GPT as a great chatbot for me to get query and learn more about different subjects, as they have a great rags set up, system set up so that you can provide the chatbot documents that users want to converse about. Uh, will the CDAO provide all of its RA knowledge base to the Nipper GPT team? So that the chatbot knows and understands all this information inherently without user upload. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we are actually working with um, with the uh, Nipper GPT team. Um, so that's from Air Force uh, Research Labs, um, and so we have a dedicated group, a uh, couple of colleagues of mine um, that are working on, um, you know, stress testing that system, trying to figure out both from the inputs that have been given to it. Um, what are the kinds of things that people, you know, want to use it for? Um, and so, you know, what guardrails, if any, do we need to sort of help build uh, around that? Um, and so, you know, yeah, I think that's that's getting at kind of the things you're saying. So, you know, uh, to the extent that we can help that system at a, you know, system level um, work more responsibly um, through the addition of, you know, guardrails or, or some other techniques, uh, I think we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, the best ways of doing that. Um, you know, a, a lot of the resources that we have um, are, you know, at, at a higher level of abstraction maybe than, than that. So you can't just, you know, make the system be responsible because it's about the interaction between, you know, the, the um, system and the user and uh, the thing that they want to use that system for. Um, so you really have to understand that whole um, that whole ecosystem or the, the system of systems um, in order to know if you're using something responsibly. Um, so as you get into the toolkit, a lot of it is around just um, really defining your use case, defining what are the, uh, the constraints or the risks uh, that you're most concerned with, and then what are the, the mitigations that you have or that, that you need to be able to um, implement given that. So, you know, that's not something because it's so specific to a given situation. It's not really something you can program into a system like uh, Nipper GPT. Um, but yeah, that being said, we're, we're definitely working with them. Um, we, you know, truly applaud the effort uh, to get Nipper GPT up and running. Because I think especially with the, um, uh, you know, LLM kind of world, um, people really have to start experimenting with it uh, in order to understand, you know, the, the best ways to use it. And so we're really glad that, that capability is there. Thank you. Uh, next question from Aurora. What are concrete metrics you have been developing regarding the human AI system collaboration and interaction considerations? Um, so concrete metrics around um, human computer interaction. Um, huh. That's a uh, that's a tough one to answer sort of um, in general. Um, so again, you know, we, we try to um, provide resources so that people can kind of figure out for themselves um, what metrics are most uh, appropriate. So for instance, um, if you're looking at, um, uh, you know, bias, um, uh, bias in a model, um, you know, we know just purely on a technical level, you can't um, eradicate bias entirely from a data set or from a model. Um, you know, mathematically, it just won't work then. Um, so we need to understand maybe what are the biases uh, of the users or of the um, ecosystem that it's being used in um, so that you can then tune the model in such a way where the bias is less harmful, uh, maybe because it counteracts uh, the bias of the the human users, or you know, the situation uh, given, or because um, we can you know optimize for um, you know errors that are less harmful than others, right? So you know, if, if what you're trying to do is um, uh, you know detect uh, illness in in a patient, you know, you can bias towards um, 
having more false positives than false negatives because you know if you determine that that's you know, like less harmful than missing some cases for instance thank you uh, our next question from jesse when you migrate the toolkit from tradewinds.com to ai.mil will other government agencies civil law enforcement etc still have access to the to the toolkit or do you have to be dod yeah so my um my intention um and as the product owner i i should get to make this decision um is to you know make it as as widely available as possible so we're probably going to leave a copy of it essentially on the trade wind site um just to make sure it's you know open to everybody no matter what i think even on the dot mill site um it's probably going to be um open to everybody but then you'll have to have a login to be able to start saving data um, and you know interacting with it in in certain ways um, and so to the extent possible if, uh, if we can make that um, with you know username and password access uh, to the right information security level um, we can do that and leave it you know available to people even outside the DoD um, if we get to the point where we have to have you know some things behind a CAC kind of firewall um, there's ways of making that even that um, accessible to people with other kinds of credentials um, so that's definitely something i'm i'm uh, really committed to uh, thank you our next question from keith uh with the quote from sun tzu uh sun tzu teaches know your enemy the cdow have a parallel initiative to develop skills tools and techniques for quote unquote irresponsible ai to be able to be inside the enemy's ai ooda loops um yeah, so a lot of um, uh, a lot of that work um, would probably sort of uh, get outside of the um, you know unclassified environment that we're in right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, what we definitely want to be able to do um, is you know understand understand AI like the the, the whole spectrum, right? So um, you know, I think. Uh, uh, irresponsible AI is a little bit of a different problem from like adversarial AI, um, but we're definitely, you know, tackling both. We want to know, like, and, and we do have techniques where it's like, um, you're, if you want to, you know, evaluate a tool that's been fully baked, um, you know, by some vendor or something, um, there are ways to, you know, evaluate those systems um, and see if it makes uh, responsible ethical sense to sort of uh, adopt them and use them in your um, in your workflow or, you know, use the outputs in some way. Uh, next question from Brandon, to what distribution level is AI approved? Yeah, so right now it's, um, it's completely unclassified. So that's why I said, um, you know, I think if you're, if you're using it on a, a government system, um, you know, because the data is saved locally, um you can you know um use it at least up to you know um that you know wh whatever your your system that you're using it is credited for um we are working on getting it on um you know aisle six and seven um which you know is a little bit uh just has has its own other challenges um but we also tried to develop it in such a way in fact some of our kind of validation partners are doing this where they're basically you know copying the questions and putting it into their own um their own workflow so i think if you have something where you're concerned about like you know cui uh, or or sensitive you know protected um personal information or something where you don't even want to like put it in this website um even though it's you know i'm telling you it's just being stored um, locally on your on your um, browser, um, you can definitely you know go the other way. Like take the questions, take the resources back out of the toolkit web app, um, and put them into your own workflow. Uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question from Lisa: How can the RAI toolkit help DoD to feel comfortable that contractors are developing slash using AI for weapon weapon systems in a way that we are comfortable with? especially in a war where AI may be used in ways not predicted. The yep. tricky part of AI is knowing if it is biased in some way, whether intentional or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, um, yeah, so 
basically that's that's one reason why um, it starts so far to the left of the actual AI system, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of these responsible AI practices start by um, being really precise about your requirements um, as you're developing them, um, trying to, you know, identify risk and um, iteratively throughout that life cycle, updating those assessments of, you know, what risks are out there and what, um, what things could go wrong so that you can design those kind of mitigations and guards. Um, we've also been doing a lot of work on um, red teaming of, of systems and red teaming of processes. Um, you know, I, I think it's um, a very good assumption that, you know, uh, in a, especially in a high conflict scenario, um, the development cycle uh, is going to be massively sped up. People are going to be, you know, innovating with stuff out on the edge, um, you know, on the battlefield itself, trying to develop things or trying to, you know, put tools uh, to novel use. Um, and so the more of the work you do ahead of time um, in both, you know, delivering requirements to that um, to that vendor, um, requiring them to do, you know, certain kinds of um, testing or, or validation um, and giving you those results. Um, and then also trying to, you know, break the system once you have it in hand, um, you know, put it through its paces, try to use it in, um, uh, you know, unintended ways or, or um, ways that weren't, um, you know, it wasn't designed for in the first place. Um, you can start finding those, um, those flaws and those, those risks um, and understand kind of what mitigations you need to put in place. Thank you. Uh, next question from Jason. My agency has been looking for an AI supplier for us to improve some of our systems and streamline some processes to assist our workforce in the field. However, we've been having a hard time finding a supplier that is FedRAP IL405 approved and or is this a CSO approved. Our yeah. cyber team is not really supporting us on other procurements, even to use only publicly available information. What advice do you have? Is CDAO working to speed up some of the review processes? Yeah, so um, that's again a great way to, or a great um, reason to go to that Tradewind AI website. So not the rai.tradewindai, but just www.tradewindai.com. Um, there's uh, some capabilities on there. One of the things called the marketplace, um, where people have um, already gone through. Um, some initial screening and initial work uh, to be able to, um, you know, contract with them kind of more quickly. So there, there's demonstrations, you know, video demonstrations of different technologies that are uh, categorized on that website. So you, you know, find um, people who have been, you know, to a certain extent pre-vetted. Um, the uh, the cyber work is, you know, a little bit um, a little bit tougher just because of the way. Uh, ATO authorities work within the department. So, you know, we're not yet at the point where we can have kind of a, a blanket a ATO or, or even kind of reciprocity um, between different um, authorizing officials. Um, but we do have a team um, in CDAO uh, that's been, you know, working on like that from a structural standpoint, um, but can also really, you know, advise you on, um, it, you know, processes or things to, you um, uh, yeah, make the ATO process uh, for your particular authorizing official work better. So, um, yeah, check out the Tradewind AI site. Um, reach out to me. I can help steer you to the right people in our cyber team. Um, but, yeah, that's definitely something we've been tackling as an org. Great. Uh, next question from Chad. How can a DOD contractor gain access to the toolkit? Um, so it's open to everybody. So hit that, you know, rai.tradewindai.com website, um, and yeah, you can uh, you can get to it there. Um, there's a contact us button if you want to know, you know, more about it or, or partner with us to uh, um, to test it out with your technology. We're always open to that. All right. Our next question from Elijah. It seems like the RAI toolkit is designed mainly to aid design and development of AI in a responsible way. Is it also a resource for an after the fact assessment when AI or autonomy has already been designed or built in, or is that outside of the intended scope? Yes, yeah, so that's definitely, you know, within the intended scope. Um, so what we would expect is, um, 
instead of basically asking these questions of your, you know, your developers, your engineers, um, that you can kind of ask them of the, the vendor or somebody that's, you know, um, either trying to sell you a thing or that, you know, you're looking at to, to bring in off the shelf. Um, so I think the toolkit in that sense gives you a really good um, framework to, you know, define your own requirements um, and then make sure you know what questions to ask uh, of the technology provider, um, excuse me, even if it's already been built. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the processes and, um, you know, tests and stuff are things that like, good engineers, good design teams um, should be doing already. Um, and so, you know, if if um, I go as far as to say if it's, you know, somebody you want to buy something from, uh, they should know what you're talking about when you start asking these questions. And, you know, if you get maybe a deer in the headlight stare, um, maybe it's a sign that, you know, it's a little bit riskier. Um, but it's definitely, uh, you know, meant to be used uh, in that situation as well as developing something from scratch. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Next question from Dan. Is there a DOD RA, RAI training for the .mil crowd? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're piloting, I think starting this month, um, we're piloting a um, RAI kind of general awareness um, course. Um, so that's something we've developed. Um, we're going to roll out for the whole um, uh, the whole community shortly. Um, you know, again, send me a note. I can I can put you in touch specifically uh, with them. The um, at, at CDAO, uh, our digital talent management team has got some other training. Um, it's been mostly focused on senior leader courses so far, uh, but we want to make sure there's you know more generalized kind of um, awareness. Uh, courses for everybody as well as uh, specialty training uh, that the RAI team is worrying as um, thinking about for um, people who are specifically uh, identified as like um, our you know AI ethics specialists. Thanks. Um, our next question, how are you thinking about integration across DOD authorities? For example, can information from RAI toolkit be used to inform or collab with OT? Um, yeah, so OT, I assume you mean like operational testing. Um, so we definitely, uh, yeah, definitely want to have those hooks in. Um, so our, at CEAO, the, uh, the testing and evaluation folks are, you know, a separate team, but we collaborate really, really closely. Um, and the way we usually say it is um, RAI processes help you understand, like, what tests are most important to run and what results are good enough. Um, and then our T&E teams are the ones making sure that those tests are available. Um, so there's another um, uh, another capability called JTIC. I'll put that in here. Um, that's also uh, available. Um, you know, there's there's information about it that's public for everybody. Um, and then there's you know DoD specific kind of logins you can get uh, to actually start um, getting those you know software packages to be able to do um, testing and evaluation yourself. Um, but yes, as far as you know, um, informing collaborating with OT, uh, we would definitely expect that you know the RAI toolkit would give you kind of the, the artifacts and the information um, to be able to make that assurance case. Um, or at least to, you know, help the, the people doing operational testing um, know what they need to be able to, uh, to test against. Um. All right. Um, and we're right at one o'clock. So the last question that we'll have today for Mr. Brooks is from Ashley. Is there a timeline for IL6 and 7 availability? So there's, there's not, a, uh, not a definite timeline, um, but I'm... Um, I'm really working hard to make sure that that happens at least during this, you know, fiscal year. Um, so I keep getting too optimistic about when it'll actually when it'll actually happen, but um, it's something I'm I'm actively working right now uh, with those um, those teams who have the the uh, authorities and platforms on those networks. Sorry, it's not super, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, super um, good answer, but doing my best. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, with that, with that said, we'll close out today. Um, happy election day to everybody. Conics, please make sure you go out and vote. Um, I would like to thank CDAO 
um, and Mr. Brooks for the presentation today. We can see by the very active Q&A that we had that this was a relevant topic to our community. Yeah. Um, please reach back out uh, to Mr. Brooks if you have follow-up questions as well as CSI Act. Um, please check back to the website for the today's slides and within a couple of days we will also have the recording up there as well um, and on the way out please uh, fill out the survey uh, we do actually read that feedback um, so we're trying to make sure we curate uh, some of these topics uh, to make it beneficial to the community but uh, thank you again to Mr. Brooks and hopefully we see you uh, see you all next month in the December uh, monthly CSI webinar awesome thanks everyone for the uh, opportunity to speak and for all the Q&A